We're actually looking at uh, Conrad's Heart of Darkness again. And um, behind me on the screen, I have Mere Christianity from C.S. Lewis. And you may wonder what on earth that is doing here. And I'm going to explain what it's doing here in a second. Um, it struck me when I was thinking about this uh, novella. And where I left off last time, just to recapitulate a little bit, because this was, as I say, published in 1899 uh, at a time uh, when what we called, or what I called the scramble for Africa, or what, not what I call, what historians call the, for the scramble Africa had taken place between 1880 and 1913. Well, in 1880, there was a Berlin conference in which the European powers met and decided to uh, legalize, legitimize, agree on um, the dividing up of Africa uh, amongst the European powers in certain respects. Making colonialism a very late appearing um, phenomenon historically, which we don't entirely expect because as we know, the idea of European colonies has been with us a great deal longer, at least since Christopher Columbus, 1492, and so forth. And um, it, that has its own checkered history. And uh, one of the things that's checkered about that history is the African slave trade of the 17th, eight, particularly the 18th century. But that lies in the mirror as far as this goes, because slavery has been abolished since the early 19th century in the British Empire and later on in France and in the United States and so forth. So that's long before, long before this um, foray into Africa takes place as um, Conrad portrays it. Um, <clears throat> and we associate colonialism with slavery and so forth, or when I say we, in pop culture of our day, or pop academia, which is not that far from pop culture because it has the same limited and very um, uh, superficial portraiture of what's happened in the past, um, these things are easily uh, conflated and confused. And what I wanted to illustrate in this study of Conrad is there's a different dimension to the uh, colonialist enterprise of the late 19th century. And there's also something being portrayed that's rather different in Conrad's novella, and it's not just the evil of colonialism, which you might think because colonialism and post-colonialism is very much of an academic, I don't want to say fad, but it is very much in, in, uh, 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 in fashion in academia for the past 30 odd years at least since the 1980s, uh, and a book called Orientalism by Edward Said, uh, which gave rise to post-colonial studies. And this book, Conrad's Heart of Darkness, is one of the key texts for uh, colonialist and post-colonialist studies. <coughs> but what this book is about, and this is what I, I was trying to, or I was at pains, and maybe not successfully, tried to demonstrate last time is there's something more at stake here than the evils of colonialism. And Conrad himself demonstrated that at the outset of the story, if you recall where we left off last time, when he said, uh, he being the narrator, Marlowe, that Britain itself had once been one of the dark places of the earth. Up in Britain, from the vantage point of the Roman Empire, when Britain was colonized, this had been one of the dark places, and the light had been Rome and the Mediterranean and so forth. That's a little bit easier to understand because Britain is cold and dark, and Rome is in a very warm and <laughs> relatively sunny place. Um, and uh, what Conrad then went on to do through his uh, protagonist, Marlowe, is to explain the difference between colonialism of his day and the colonialism of the Romans. And what he uh, focused on was the devotion to an ideal in his day. And the ideal was that of efficiency. Where is this? 
And he talked about even his, uh, the colonialism historically, mentions of Francis Drake and Sir John Franklin, by the way, who are two explorers that are currently being uh, deplatformed in the UK at a school right now as we speak. The, the statues to these explorers are being removed because of colonialism and the, and the invidious consequences of the legacy of it, colonialism, etc. So it hit traditional explorers, etc. So what I am suggesting here is that there is a um, climate which has moved from the academy into activism in social society more generally against colonialism across the board or even exploration as a, as a hostile act. And I think that's deeply uh, problematic because it's so superficial uh, in, man in many ways, but also because it connects things that don't necessarily deserve to be connected and it ignores the particular evil that Heart of Darkness is about. And the particular evil of Heart of Darkness is not about exploration per se, it's about the evil that comes from, and where is it, this devotion to efficiency. So last time, when he's talking about the Romans, he said they were no colonialists. Oh, I, by bumping it out, I... That was a mistake. There we go. None of us would feel exactly like this. Now I might just, I just did it. I, okay, now I can go back. None of us would feel exactly like this. What saves us is efficiency, the devotion to efficiency. But these chaps were not much account really, that is the Romans. They were no col colonists. Their administration was merely a squeeze and nothing more. I suspect they were conquerors and for that you want only brute strength, force, nothing to boast of when you have it, since your strength is just an accident arising from the weakness of others. So it's a comparative weakness. Whereas in this period, there's a sense of absolute devotion to efficiency in conquering things. Now, it's not just a commitment on a different scale. It's from a different motivation. And the motivation I suggested last time gave rise from a certain view of human nature, which I trace back to Charles Darwin and his idea of the evolution of the species. And remember the mechanism for the species to evolve or make progress was the idea of the survival of the fittest. And the idea of the survival of the fittest is that there are only certain um, numbers and members of any given population that would be fit to survive and the others would simply die out. And that's the mechanism for evolution is that the less uh, capable of survival members, whatever animals, beings there were that were not capable of survival would simply perish. But the more capable would evolve into something superior. And with that in mind, uh, in the mid 19th century and onwards, and only from this period, this idea of human evolution took on legs and it was advanced the idea that among the human uh, population, broadly speaking, there were different races. And among the different races, w only one of them would be fit to survive, right? And the, the ones that would be most fit to survive, if you look at the works of the time, and you can go from Darwin to, as I say, uh, Heckel, were the white Europeans. Now, this is a very different dynamic than the slave trade, even the transatlantic slave trade. That is exploitation. That is brutality. It's treating people like commodities. That's a different drive than one of we must conquer to demonstrate our fitness to survive. And by treating other people as speed bumps along the way to that drive for progress, we're just expediting a process that's happening naturally anyway. So it's actually an imperative to crush and oppress others. That comes from the motivation of the survival of the fittest mechanism. That's what I'm presenting to you. It's a different motivation entirely. It's not just 
for the sake of wealth, it's for the sake of survival. And, and, and what will allow one group to prosper ahead of another is efficiency, a total commitment to that. And it becomes totalitarian. And it become, it's, the, it's the source of um, national education programs. Everything gets seized by the, by the, by, by the central governments, whether it's in, uh, in Europe or North America or whatever, and there's a sort of an uploading of responsibility for the sake of the nation state as it's, it's conceived. And by the way, the national movement is concurrent with uh, the Romantic period. The idea of the modern nation state is a 19th century invention. And it takes on um, a, a, a sort of an impetus for it to be more and more efficient at furthering the um, survival and uh, improvement of its own people. It takes it as its, its responsibility. We need to make sure that the citizenry evolves in such a way that they will be superior to the other nations. And we'll show that in things like the Olympic Games, which comes again in 1896, I think, first Olympic Games, first modern Olympic Games in Athens. And the First World War is largely initiated by European powers, each with who believes that their devotion to efficiency has given their nation state the means by which to conquer the others and to prove that they're fit to survive. And they believe that the war will be over quickly and that'll be the end of it. And they end up with a war of attrition for four years in the trenches of Europe over, and millions die in mud over a few miles of land. And then they all grind to a halt, collapse, and then it rises up again in, in the, the Second World War. But it's a commitment to something that is other than a Christian motivation for even uh, uh, colonization. Colonization, you could see as an aspect of the dominion mandate, to be fruitful and multiply, fill and subdue the earth, bring it under your dominion, be good stewards of creation. That's a Christian motivation that's, that's different than this. That's not the motivation of survival. This is the motivation of survival. And it has a moral register that's very different than Christianity once again, because in, in the Christian understanding, what you are doing is bringing about God's kingdom mandate into all the earth. And that will include evangelization, sharing the gospel, bringing the good news. If you read uh, the Great Commission at the end of, let's say, uh, Matthew's gospel, it sounds very much like a reiteration of the dominion mandate given in Genesis 1. So now you're not just supposed to make an Eden of the whole earth, you're, you're, you're supposed to do it to all nations as they've arisen from the time of Abraham onwards. Remember he said he'll be the father of many nations. The man of faith, Abraham, the model of that. And when you do that, you're supposed to bring a God-declared uh, differentiation of what constitutes good, and what constitutes evil. There's a light and there's a darkness, there's right and wrong. It's, it's morally driven. And that's supposed to pervade the law, education, politics, etc. That's the dominion mandate given to the church. This is a very different thing. And I, I need to say that because we associate 19th century Europe with Christianity. But the drive for this, the scramble for Africa, is not motivated by Christians at all. It's driven by the belief that the way in which human society evolves or progresses is through scientific advancement, which will only be proven by defeating the nations around us. It's got a war motivation. Does that make any sense? Let me show you where I start up with why was I going to mirror Christianity here? Let's let me skew out here. So these were broadcast talks given by C.S. Lewis during the Second World War. Um, and in part two of that, now where is part two? It's roughly speaking here. What Christians believe. He talks about rival conceptions of God. And I just want to read a little extract from this because you will find it, I think, helpful in orienting you into what I think is going on in Heart of Darkness, namely a world in which there is no good and evil anymore. In a Christian conception, there is a good and there's an evil, 
there's a right and a wrong. It's rooted in the creation order. God calls certain things good. He calls other things not good. But in, in the Genesis account, God separates the land from the sea, the light from the darkness, the um, various animals, and he calls it good. And he creates man in his own, own image, and he says, this is very good. He calls them male and female. Differentiation. The differentiation is a good thing. But that's not the only view of, of good and evil. There is a rival conception of this related to rival conception of God. And this is why I'm going to go to C.S. Lewis here and just use this as background to explain what Lewis says in better words than I could to uh, get us into what Conrad is displaying in Heart of Darkness. Here's Lewis. I've been asked you to tell you what Christians believe, and I'm going to begin by telling you one thing that Christians do not believe. If you are a Christian, you do not have to believe that all the other religions are simply wrong all through. If you are an atheist, you do have to believe that the main point in all the religions of the whole world is simply one huge mistake. If you're a Christian, you're free to think that all these religions, even the queerest ones, contain at least some hint of the truth. When I was an atheist, I had to try to persuade myself that most of the human race have always been wrong about the question that matters to them most. When I became a Christian, I was able to take a more liberal view. But of course, being a Christian does not mean thinking that where Christianity differs from other religions, Christianity is right and they are wrong. As in arithmetic, there is only one right answer to a sum, and all other answers are wrong, but some of the wrong answers are much nearer being right than others. The first big division of humanity is into the majority who believe in some kind of God or gods, and the minority who do not. On this point, Christianity lines up with the majority. Lines up with the ancient Greeks and Romans, who are polytheists, the modern savages who believe in gods, the Stoics who believe in uh, a divine principle, the Logos, the Platonists, the Hindus, the, the Mohammedans, etc., against the modern Western European materialist. Note that Lewis writing this in 19, or saying this in 1943, is suggesting that the modern Western European materialist, the same people Joseph Conrad's talking about in Heart of Darkness, are not in agreement with the world religions. They're, they're opposed to this. They have a different view. What is their view? Well, we'll come to that in a second. Now we go on to the next big division. People who all believe in God can be divided according to the sort of God they believe in. There are two very different ideas on the subject. One of them is the idea, the idea that he is beyond good and evil. He's beyond all such categories. We humans call one thing good and another thing bad, but according to some people, that is merely our human point of view. These people would say that the wiser you become, the less you would want to call anything good or bad, and the more dearly you would see that everything is good in one way and bad in another, and that nothing could have been different. Consequently, these people think that long before you got anywhere near the divine point of view, the distinction would have disappeared altogether. We call a cancer bad, they would say, because it kills a man. But you might as well, just as well say, call a successful surgeon bad because he kills a cancer. It all depends on the point of view. The other and opposite, opposite idea is that God is quite definitely good or righteous. A God who takes sides, who loves love and hates hatred, who wants us to behave in one way and not in another. The first of these views, the one that's represented in Heart of Darkness, and the one who thinks that everything de depends on your point of view. Somebody calls this good, another person might call it evil, it depends on where you're how you're looking at it, from what vantage point. The first of these views, the one who thinks that God is beyond good and evil, is called pantheism. It was held by the great Prussian philosopher Hegel, by the modern university, the modern secular Western University of Germany, that then eventually was brought into the United States and Canada and in, into England over the course of the 19th century. And as far as I can understand them, the Hindus, the, others, the other views held by Jews, Mohammedans, and Christians. What we're dealing here with pantheist, pantheism, where good and evil are matters of point of view, that's the perspective in Heart of Darkness. And hence, 
the perspective that we see right at the outset in the book where he talks about things in a very much of a Genesis sense. There's a flood and the wind and the sea reach connecting the sea and the sky were welded together without a joint as if sea and sky of water and air are actually now one and not separate things. He's echoing Genesis in this account. I mean, it's oblique reference, but it's, it's there. And furthermore, the ambiguity we're going to see about everything, the, the sense of haze and grayness where, where good and evil are, are, are almost on a continuum. And it's a matter of perspective. Is the, is the dominant perspective written in Heart of Darkness? He's regularly going to be conflating and to some degree confusing the categories of right and wrong, good and evil. And I'll give you a, a further um, demonstration of this. This is from a letter by Conrad, 1898, in which he writes to a friend by the name of R.B. Cunningham Graham, one year before he writes this novella, he says, quote, there is no morality, no knowledge, and no hope. There is only the consciousness of ourselves which drives us about a world that whether seen in a convex or concave mirror is always but a vain and fleeting appearance. So there is no morality, no knowledge, and no hope. There's just looking at things from either a concave or a convex mirror. Do you know what those are? One's curved in, the other's curved out. And it distorts the image. It's not the image that we see when we look in a mirror now. It's, one that may, it's either a fat mirror or a thin mirror. <laughs> and, but one way or another, it, it distorts the image. And that's the distortion that comes from perspectivalism. And that's what uh, Conrad is displaying throughout Heart of Darkness. So if you're, when I said that the narrator was unreliable. I didn't mean it unreliable in an epistemological sense, although there's a bit of that. It's like he's morally unreliable. And there is no, um, there is no morally reliable voice in Heart of Darkness. And that's because what Conrad is doing, I'm submitting to you, is a reflection of pantheism, European pantheism, which is driving and motivated by a social Darwinism, survival of the fittest, there's no morally right, no morally wrong action in an absolute sense. It's all a matter of perspective. And there'll be lots of different images of perspective throughout the novella, including the pictures of the map. And as I said, in the, the picture of the map that's used here, it will be this area here where certain tribes are in the Belgian Congo here, uh, is white. And furthermore, it will have another image of evil in it, namely the Congo River, which is portrayed to be like a snake going into the whiteness. Clear images of evil, the serpentine. Yes. I have a couple of questions. Okay, please ask clarification questions. So, first one, with the scramble for Africa, was the desire to prove fitness just a wrestle between the European countries? Or Pretty much. No, they were quite convinced by this point, by the, by the, because of the Industrial Revolution and the industrialization of all the European powers, it was clear that they were superior to any other tribe, nation, people on earth. They brought subjugation um, globally. The British Empire is literally everywhere. It's in India, it's in uh, Australia, it's in Canada, the United States, into South Africa or into South America, and even into Africa, well, this is the whole pink here. And it will include um, British Palestine and so forth, all, all manner of places. And this is uh, only possible because of the British Navy. It's technology that allows this little small country uh, up in the northwest of Europe to effectively have an empire across the globe. And the question I said, and we looked at this in relation to Tennyson, is how on earth did such a thing happen? And what do we make of it? And what do we do with it? Because I'm not sure initially that's even an intention. 
it's not a domineering, you know, we're going to demonstrate, but by, the, but by the late 19th century, it takes on a different character because of the Darwinist teaching and the idea of the survival of the fittest. It takes a different character and it's more of, we're not doing it for the sake of enrichment, we're doing it for the sake of survival, our survival. No matter how rich we are, only one of the, or, or one people is going to survive out of this. And who's it going to be? Well, it better be us or it's going to be somebody else. Because this, this teaching, which is contrary to scripture, it's, and it's contrary to the idea that every human being bears the image of God, is pushing them to treat, to treat other people in a dehumanizing way that actually exceeds that of the African slave trade. It actually exceeds it. Because the motivation is different. It's for survival. And, it, and again, because it's pantheist, it will dispense with moral considerations. So would you say like the Darwinist findings, like they're what's the word? inspired more so fear than like a sense of pride? Yes. Yeah? Yes. Okay. Because I feel like if it was pride... A little bit of pride as well, of course. Yeah. Because then they're going to show off their technology. The World's Fair began in Crystal Palace in London in the late... 18th century or 19th century as well. And the idea of these world fairs and so forth is to show off the technology of the country hosting them. Same with the Olympic Games, all to show off where we are on the, pick, on, the, on the ladder of progression, to demonstrate that we're actually the race that's progressing and, and by consequence, we're gonna survive. It's a funny old motivation, but again, if you think there are no, there's no God or that everything's God, you're a pantheist, then the only proof that God exists is in how you advance or don't advance as a people. So it's a, it's a different motivation. Because I feel like if it was less so fear, there might be a desire for like an even playing field in terms of like who is deemed the fittest. Because with the Uber benches that you mentioned in last class, like I feel like they're already at a disadvantage. Say like the other nations who even go through the enlightenment. So I feel like it's unfair for them to be comparing if there isn't that level of like it would be unfair, but there but again, um, they they appeal to nature, not to reason here. And nature is relentless. It chooses for us. And how do we know what its choice is? By the one who's left standing. The people who die didn't get chosen. That was it. So it's not even something that you can control per se. It's, a, it's an irrational force. And the appeal to genetics, which comes later, um, we'll even talk about Richard Dawkins' famous phrase for, for this is the selfish gene. We don't even choose who our uh, partner in life is, our husband and wife is. We, we sort of feel a drive or our genes are basically making the choice for us. It's not even a, you know, we used to marry people off and the parents would decide, you know, this is a good partner for you. Now it's a sort of a subconscious genetic material, choosing other genetic material according to fitness that drives the whole genetic motivation thing. You, if you watch those nature shows that are so popular with Sir Richard Attenborough, they, he talks about exactly that sort of bizarre, irrational genetic drive to, for creatures to survive that also drives human beings. And by making it sub or irrational or subrational, they're saying that we can't control it, but we it's but it's happening nonetheless. Okay, so like out so with the irrationality and nature, then all things morality and fairness like fail in comparison during this. Well, according to, again, if you follow the logic of Lewis here, and I and I do, um, things like goodness and evil and justice and injustice. Those are just a matter of perspective. And, and now we're into Thrasymachus' concept of justice, what that might makes right. Except now it's not quite that same appeal, it's more that if might doesn't do what's right for the mighty, it will not survive. So it's a drive to, towards injustice because it denies the commonality of humanity on the basis of we all bear the image of God, whether we're black or white or whatever, shades of brown, or male or female or religions, that sort of idea that we all bear the image of Adam and Eve, the image of God, 
goes away. And then we get the appeal of the now scientific view of Darwinism that we follow evolution to its inevitable outcome, which is survival of some at the expense of others. It's a different sort of dominion mandate. And I say this because Christians are being tagged to this day for colonialism and all of the evils that come with it. And I say that it's a, it is a demonstrable lie. And I've just given something of the demonstration. And to blame Christians for it is to evade, I'm not even particularly, um, I don't particularly care that Christians are being blamed or slandered for things that are not Christian uh, per se, although I am interested in it because I am a Christian, but I'm not defending it or attacking it on that basis. I'm um, critiquing it because it's false and because the consequence of that is to do the same thing without getting to the root of the problem. The root of the problem is the wickedness in the human heart. It's sin. That's the problem. It's not Christianity. The devotion to, uh, to efficiency and to survival at the expense of every other human being, if need be, is a wicked doctrine. And that doctrine needs to be addressed, not just for Christians, but for everybody's sake. That's, that's the point. So it's not special pleading on behalf of Christians. Oh, you're being unfair to us. Christians did some good things, you know, as well, as well as some bad. Yeah, we have a legacy. That's not the point. True though, it is. It's just pure slander. But the point is that the motivation for it is wicked and it's, and it's a different one than you're suggesting. It's the devotion to efficiency. That's the problem. And efficiency means survival of the fittest because the fittest are gonna be the most efficient at surviving. Just watch the nature programs. The animals that survive are the most efficient and most capable at doing whatever they have to do to survive. They got the biggest teeth, they got the strongest muscles, they're the youngest, whatever, that's what drives it all, right? They have the fewest genetic copying mistakes in their gene pool, right? And they, if they don't, then they're simply gonna die. So I, I, get, may, I took, gave you one quote from a letter to R.B. Cunningham, January 31st, 1898. Here's another one um, to uh, Edward Garnett. I still have some pretensions to the possession of a conscience, though my morality is gone to the dogs. I am like a man who has lost his gods. That doesn't mean that he's endorsing nihilism, but it does mean that um, what is intrinsic to morality and makes socially responsible and politically just actions, he has is no longer going to appeal to them because he doesn't believe in them at all. There's no ground to make a moral appeal. There's none. And so the images of that, does this make any sense, by the way? Because I really want you to get inside what's going on in Heart of Darkness and the, and the strange way, the very strange way in which he describes things. And when you're reading, you're thinking, I'm finding it really difficult to figure out what's going on here. It's a confusing novella. I mean, the language is interesting. There's a lot of symbolism, um, and I, I can recognize that, but I have a really difficult time finding out where I'm supposed to be in relation to the narrative. Am I, do I like the narrator or do I dislike the narrator? Who, whose side am I on? Because usually you find there's the good guys and the bad guys in, in any story. Maybe the character telling the story is, not, is a bad guy and not a good guy. The problem in Heart of Darkness is there are no good guys. Everybody is morally confused. And that's demonstrated in a variety of ways. But, and, and we've already looked at a bit of, a, a bit of this uh, insofar as the main protagonist, whose name is Marlow, the ship sea captain, is presented as being like a Buddha. He's not attacking hid, uh, you know, Buddhism here. He's talking about that his gaze is inward, just like the Buddha. The, eye, the eyes, even though he's looking out at you, are, he doesn't have pupils. He, looking inwards and he's holding his hands up and he's suggesting the unity of all things. It's a sort of a unifying Eastern philosophy. In Eastern philosophies, by the way, Eastern religions, there is no God. You knew that, right? No, okay, well, now you do. Eastern religions have no God. 
in Hind Hinduism, so-called, which is a Western invention, by the way, the term Hinduism, they have uh, many gods, billions, millions of gods. And, and, and because of that, they don't actually even, ha the Hinduism as a, as a descriptor for all of them is unhelpful because they're, they're so different. It's just different forms of tribalistic gods all thrown together, chaos. And, and in the other ones, like, like, uh, like Buddhism, there is no god. Yes? What's the difference? Well, I guess it depends on how you define God. Or person. Or person. Because yeah. how would you reference these? A way? Yeah. yeah, and C.S. Lewis, and, and in mere Christianity or in The Abolition of Man, he, he is going to do what you suggested there, I think, from that vantage, and suggest there is a commonality even between Eastern religions and Western. There's something called the Tao, the way. There's a commonality and perspective on the way to live life. And it will be irrespective of whether they actually believe in a personal God. Lewis will talk about that in mere Christianity as well. So some believe that there is a personal God and some don't. But here, in, with respect to rival conceptions of God, some are pantheists, think God is everything everything's God. And then there's some that think that God is personal and is connected with the good. And what opposes him is evil. Now he's, and he's, he's conflating, and, I, but I don't want to get into world religions discussion comparison here per se, because it's, it's a little bit off track. I always go off track anyway. I don't need off tracks from my off tracks. Because <laughs> then you wonder what the track was in the beginning at the end of all, and we end up in the heart of darkness every class. So let's avoid the heart of darkness in class at any rate and just study the heart of darkness in class. Um, but Ar but Marlowe is a yarn. The yarns of semen have a direct simplicity, the whole meaning of which lies within the shell of a cracked nut. What on earth does that mean? <coughs> Who knows what it means? It's very simplistic, it's very straightforward, but what on earth is he talking about? Yeah, I guess. <laughs> the shell of a crack nut, there's nothing inside of it. It's clear and straightforward, except it doesn't mean anything. It's like Macbeth, uh, when his wife dies, a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing. That's about what he's saying here. But Marlowe is not typical if his propensity to spin yarns be accepted. And to him, the meaning of an episode was not inside like a kernel, but outside, enveloping the tale which brought it out only as a glow brings out a haze in the likeness of one of those misty halos that sometimes are made visible by the spectral illumination of moonshine. Well, that sounds very beautiful, but what on earth does that mean? So it's not the empty kernel inside, it's the empty kernel outside, I guess. It's still empty. It, or do you understand something more from that? It seems to me that the, although he elaborates, it's not like the inside of the empty kernel of a cracked nut, but the outside of it, I think, well, that's equally meaningless. It's a nonsensical d distinction. Nothing, is, whether it's inside or outside, is still nothing. And now it just reflects the whole world. The whole world is meaningless. It's sort of nihilistic in that sense. So he's beyond good and evil, and, and with reference to the Ubermensch that you talked about, it, it occurred to me afterwards, I didn't quite finish the illustration. The Übermensch is the civilizations that are on the top climbing upwards, and the Untermensch, connected by a rope, is those benighted civilizations that we're pulling along with us and improving them. It's the white man's burden. Nietzsche suggests that for true, the Übermensch to truly be the Übermensch, he should get rid of the idea of Judeo-Christian morality altogether, the slave mentality get rid of the idea of serving others. Cut the cord. You be who you are, the Ubermensch, the, and, and you keep on climbing, but don't do that with the burden of having to carry everybody else with you, as if you had a commonality with, a, with other people. Because you don't. You are a new type of being, whatever it is. We're gonna see what you are 
when you become what you are. But don't, you're not going to become that by holding on to people who are less capable of survival. You shouldn't care for the poor. You shouldn't take uh, the widows and the orphans and the lame and the sick and the ill. The mentality of Christianity, of, of seeing in the, the, the poor, the weak, the sick, the lame, your fellow human beings who deserve your compassion and your mercy and the touch of God and the deserve justice. All of these appeals, Nietzsche says, are part of the slave mentality of Christianity that we need to be dispensed with. We li here in Heart of Darkness, we have a Nietzschean world where, where we have Ubermenschen. And one of them is Marlowe, the ship's captain, but his, the best exponent is Mr. Kurtz, the, the, the ivory trader who's gone into the Congo and will do anything because he's devoted to efficiency to extract ivory. And when we say anything, it means that nothing will stand in his way. He'll murder anyone who gets in his way. He'll terrify the natives into giving him more ivory to save their lives. He'll set up a little cult of himself. They think he's a god. And he's happy to let them think that. And he starts to think it himself. So that's where we began last time. Does it make sense? But it, what, what saves us is efficiency, the devotion to efficiency. Whereas the Romans just grabbed what they could get for the sake of what was to be God. It was just robbery with violence. Aggravated murder on a great scale. That's how they, the modern academy sees heart of darkness. It's just taking stuff away. We need to give it back, redistribute it back. That's not the problem. The problem is efficiency. And efficiency is motivated by survival. Because the survival of the fittest means the most efficient. If you ever played video games, like civilization and stuff, the, the most efficient societies at producing, creating goods and delivering them back and, and building the civilization, those are the ones that survive. You can do it by killing off all the others, or you can do it by building up your civilization and just uh, outdoing them in terms of product productivity. Right? That's how our modern economies work. No? Gross domestic product has to expand every year on such a scale, and it's a race. Determined by material wealth and so forth. The conquest of the earth, which mostly means the taking it away from those who have a different complexion or slightly fatter nose than ourselves, is not a pretty thing when you look into it too much. What redeems it is the idea only, an idea at the back of it. Not a sentimental pretense, but an idea, an unselfish belief in the idea, something you can set up and bow down before and offer a sacrifice to. And what is the, sac what is the idol of efficiency? It's the idol of ourselves. If we're the most efficient, we will serve the God, which we are. So it's a self-idolatry connected to technology. Technology is the sort of proof. How do I know that we are more, we are more advanced than Homer's Odysseus? Because I have a smartphone. That's why. I'm not going to appeal to me being morally superior to Achilles, my bravery versus his bravery. Who cares about that? Bravery, moral considerations, who is a, who is a more virtuous man, who cares? Who's going to survive? The man with the guns or the man with the spear? Right? That's how it's portrayed in science fiction as well. The, the, with the most developed technology is the fittest to survive. And we can get rid of virtue and uh, vice as even considerations in it. So there's a, a, an appeal to machines and technology as proof positive of our superiority. And that's it. That's the world that, Mar that uh, Conrad's describing in Heart of Darkness. So when he does this, and there's a little uh, conversation here, and then he talks about maps, and when he was a boy and grew up, and he had a passion for maps, and he would look for hours at South America or Africa or Australia. I remember doing this myself with the globe. I thought it was really interesting. Uh, but, the, but in his day, and I would say, oh, I'm going to want to go here one day. Put your finger on it. In his day, there were places on the globe 
that were terra incognita. They had not yet been charted. They had not been uh, colonized. There wasn't a nation there. It was just a blank on the canvas. Just imagine that. The Congo was one of such places, and he wanted to go there. And the problem is that there was one yet, the biggest, the blank, most blank, so to speak, that I had to got a hankering after. And what is it? Well, it's this place, the Congo. By this time, it was not a blank space anymore. It had got filled since my boyhood with rivers and lakes and names. It had ceased to be a blank space of delightful mystery, a white patch for a boy to dream gloriously over. It had become a place of darkness. Now, there's an interesting thing. How did it be go from being white to darkness? Because it has names. And the names are connected with progress and efficiency and annihilation. He's connecting efficiency and darkness together. There you go. But there was in it one river especially, a mighty big river that you could see on the map resembling an immense snake uncoiled with its head in the sea, its body at rest, curving afar over a vast country and its tail lost in the depths of the land. And as I looked at the map of it in a shop window, it fascinated me as a snake would a bird, a silly little bird. Then I remember there was a big concern, a company for trade on that river. Dash it all, I thought to myself. They can't trade without using some kind of craft on that lot of fresh water. Steamboats, why shouldn't I try to get charge of one? I went along to Fleet Street, but could not shake off the idea the snake had charmed me. You know how snake charmers work? At least as they are portrayed in India, you, you blow the, whatever the instrument is and the, and the, the uh, cobra does a little dance and so forth. But here it's the other way around. He is charmed by the snake, which is the river going into the Congo. It, it has captured his mind in some way. So he's, there's an idol that he set up in his mind, which corresponds to this snake in the Congo. And there's something about this that draws him. What is it that draws him? And he applies for a job. And what does he go? He, gets, he applies to be the steamboat captain. And because he's got experience, he gets the job and he, it appears that the company had received news that one of their captains had been killed in a scuffle with the natives this was my chance and it made me the more anxious to go it was only months and months afterwards when i'd made the attempt to recover what was left of the body that i heard the original quarrel arose from a misunderstanding among some hens yes two black hens congolese and the man who was killed was named Freisleven. Now, does that have any connotations for you? Nobody speaks German. Not German anyway, but it's in that direction. Free slave. Sklave in, in German is slave, but it's close enough in English, free slave. Freisleven. What, that was the fellow's name, was a Dane, thought himself wrong somehow in the bargain. So he went ashore, started to hammer the chief of the village with a stick, whacking him. And oh, it didn't surprise me in the least to hear this. And at the same time, to be told that Frey Slavin was the gentlest, quietest creature that ever walked on two legs. So it wasn't because of his bad character. It was because he considered himself uh, racially superior. No doubt he was the quietest, gentlest creature. But he had been a couple of years already out there engaged in the noble cause, you know, and he probably felt the need at, le at last of asserting his self-respect in some way. Therefore, he whacked the old nigger mercilessly. Now, I apologize for the language here, but again, this would just be language relating to um, color um, in, in Latin negro. Black mercilessly while a big crowd of his people watched him thunderstruck till some man i was told the chief son in desperation at hearing the old chap yell made a tentative jab with the spear at the white man and of course it went through quite easily between the shoulder blades why he wasn't trying to kill him even just trying to stop him why didn't he think it would kill him because he thought he was a god why do you think he was a god because he was white why would somebody who was white be even regarded as a god by people who are black because they had the technology to do things that were impossible with a spear. You can cast 
You can shoot at a distance. Got all sorts of technological means, the steam engine, that sort of thing. Where I pick it up and it's got horsepower. Where are the horses? Right? It's extraordinary. Combustion engine, all that sort of stuff. Then the whole population cleared into the forest, expecting all kinds of calamities to happen. While on the other hand, the steamer, Frey, slave and commanded, left also in a bad panic in charge of the engineer, I believe. Afterwards, nobody seemed to trouble much about Frey Slavin's remains till I got out and stepped into his shoes. So the portrait here is of a place where Frey Slavin beats a man because moral considerations don't apply and they kill him because they don't even think he's a man. They think he's a god and they just happen to because he's, he is a man despite... Uh, their expectations, and he just kills them. But all of these things are just told in a very matter-of-fact fashion without any of the judgments that we would immediately uh, connect to it. So even the word nigger here, I mean, people recoil at that, you can't say the n-word, whatever. Here it's told matter-of-factly as just part of the tapestry of the whole story uh, and the ambiguity of moral considerations throughout. Just, it's there. Um, and then he goes in to the place of the employer. And let, let me just spend a little bit of time here before moving on to part two and three. Yes? The N word? No. You, you, if you read um, it from African-American authors, even in the 19th century, 20th century, same words are used without any sort of moral um, charge to them. That comes up later. Nowadays, it's sort of done in reverse. You know, you can, if you're black, you can refer to other blacks as in that, but you can't do it in, if you're white, you can't go, which is, I, I still have not quite understood all of that strangeness. Like either the word is, has morally derogatory connotations or it doesn't, right? It does or it doesn't. And if it does, then you shouldn't use it because it's derogatory. And if it doesn't, then who cares? It matters more other, other sorts of things. Anyway, here it's just used uh, sort of universally. Yeah. So without, without the connotations that, as I say, when we read it now, uh, and, and American fiction, I think I had the same thing in, um, gosh, what book did I read in high school? Uh, now I'm going to come across it, but it's sort of on the banned book list now. Tom Sawyer. No, I didn't, it wasn't Tom Sawyer even. It was, uh, gosh, what's it called? Sorry? It's about a case of a, the murder in the defense of a black man by a white attorney. To kill a mockingbird. You can't read it anymore. It's bad because he it uses the N-word. I was thinking, but it's against slavery. It's against, <laughs> it's, a, it's actually arguing that uh, against the racism of a community. Harper Lee, right? It's, it's just the use of the word is considered offensive. And I think, well, then how can you help people uh, avoid racism if you're not going to promote a book that speaks against racism? I mean, I have, d I have deep problems with this strange way in which the academy decides things now. It doesn't seem to be achieving what it purports to intend to achieve. Um, anyway. Anyway, back to this. He goes into, and, and now he's in Brussels, it, where the company is, because the company in Brussels, it, it, Brussels is in Belgium, and the Congo, where the company works, is where he's going to go. So he goes to Brussels and meets these ladies. Two women, one fat, the other slim, sat on straw bottom chairs, knitting black wool. The slim one got up and walked straight at me, still knitting with downcast eyes, and only just as I began to think of getting out of her way, as you would for a somnambulist, stood still and looked up. Her dress was as plain as an umbrella cover. 
and she turned round without a word and preceded me into a waiting room. I gave my name and looked about, deal, table in the middle, plain chairs all around the walls, on one end a large shining map marked with all the colors of the rainbow, just like this on the right. There was a vast amount of red. Good to see at any time. Well, that's the British. There was a, uh, because one knows that some real work is done in there. A deuce of a lot of blue, French, little green, smears of orange, and on the east coast, a purple patch. I guess it would be where the orange is here. A purple patch to show where the jolly pioneers of progress drank the jolly lager beer. However, I wasn't going into any of these. I was going into the yellow, dead in the center, and the river was there fascinating, deadly, like a snake. Oh, a door opened and a white-haired secretarial head, just wearing a compassionate expression, peered and a skinny forefinger beckoned me into the sanctuary. And then he goes and there's the great man. He was five foot six, I should judge. No, he's the great man. He's not great in the sense of tall. He's only five foot six. And we shake hands and we speak in French. And he goes there and he is being um, inter interviewed and often far away later on I thought of these two the two women guarding the door of darkness knitting black wool as for a warm pall one introducing introducing continuously to the unknown the other scrutinizing the cheery and foolish faces with unconcerned old eyes ave old knitter of black wool mortuturi te salutant those about to die, we salute you, what they used to say in the arena in Rome. In other words, the people coming into the company to go do the company's business are expected to die in the process of doing this. And the company is, gar are, these two women are guarding the door of darkness, one pulling them in, the other taking them out. Sort of a demonic portrait. And then he gets a visit to the doctor, and the doctor manages, uh, measures his vitals but particularly he's interested in his skull. He's like, like cranial measurements. Like, what, what's going on here? Pulse and all that sort of thing. But let me just do this. And why is that? I always ask leave in the interest of science to measure the crania of those going out there, he said. And when they come back too, I asked, oh, I never see them, he remarked. And moreover, the changes take place inside, you know. He smiled as if at some quiet joke. What happens when civilized people go into a place where moral considerations are no longer considered, where there's no law, is they do whatever they want. And they become evil in the process because there's no judgment, there's no justice. By the way, Kurtz is the man he goes to get. The reason that he's going to get Kurtz is because Kurtz is no longer delivering the ivory as he did before. He's gone to get him keeping the ivory for himself. He's not delivering it as he once did. It's not because he's not good at getting the ivory. It's because he's not delivering it to the company. That's, he's not being efficient. He's being selfish in his motivations. But anyway, he wants to measure his crania. Why? Because when he comes out, all he's going to have is a skull to go on the basis. And he'll say, oh, OK, it's this wide. That's that guy. That's it. So it's very morbid at the very outset. And that, that as I say, the, the perspective here of moral pantheism throughout, moral uh, as in the sense of, if your doctor was taking your measurements so that he could identify you when you were dead, you would think this is a strange doctor. <laughs> He's not concerned with my health. He does it in the name of science. Not in concern of the patients. And he says, um, interesting, watch, watch the mental changes of individuals on the spot, but are you an alienist? I interrupted. Every doctor should be a little, answered that original imperturbably. I have a little theory which you messieurs who go out there must help me to prove. This is my share in the advantages my country shall reap from the possession of such a magnificent dependency. The mere wealth I leave to others. Pardon my questions, but you are the first Englishman coming under my observation. I hastened to assure him I was not in the least typical. 
If I were, said I, I wouldn't be talking like this with you. What you say is rather profound and probably erroneous, he said with a laugh. Avoid irritation more than exposure to the sun. Adieu. What do you English say, eh? Goodbye. Ah, goodbye. Adieu. In the tropics, one must, before everything, keep calm. He lifted a warning forefinger. Do calm. Do calm. Stay calm. Don't, don't get agitated. Don't go mad. Because everybody goes there goes mad. What sort of madness? It's not they get bit by a mosquito. It's they become morally insane. They lose their compass. They die spiritually before they die physically. That's what he's warning about. So again, throughout and from the beginning and on through the entire narrative, moral perspective is being questioned and agreed to. The company does not care that the, they're going to send people to die. They don't actually, they don't care about anything. No moral consideration. By the way, the portrait of Brussels here, he call, it's called a whitewashed sepulcher. Taken obviously directly from scripture, describing what? Who's, who's described as a whitewashed sepulcher? The Pharisees, yes. And the Brussels itself in the midst of that, okay. So let me skip over that and we'll go through the Congo. I'm going to skip over a fair bit here. And we're going to be in the Congo already. Marlow on the steamboat in the midst of this. And he will not see anything because it's relatively dark. He will hear things in the dark. And one evening as I was lying flat on the deck of my sea boat, I heard voices approaching and there were the nephew and the uncle strolling along the bank. I laid my head on my arm again and had nearly lost myself in a doze when somebody said in my ear, as it were, I am as harmless as a little child, but I don't like to be dictated to. Am I the manager or am I not? I was ordered to send him there. It's incredible. Reference to who? To him. Am I the manager or not? I was ordered to send him there and there's somebody disagreeing with him that he shouldn't do this. There's an awareness of the danger to the sea captain who's rather ignorant about what's going to happen when he goes down the river, which he's going to face Kurtz and probably be killed. And somebody's objecting to this and, and the manager says, I'm, am I in charge or not? And Marlow, who is hearing this, doesn't really react to it. We don't see of any response. I became aware that the two we're standing on the shore alongside the fore part of the steamboat just below my head. I did not move. It did not occur to me to move. I was sleepy. It is unpleasant, grunted the uncle. He has asked the administration to be sent there, said the other, with the idea of showing what he could do. And I was instructed accordingly. Look at the influence that man must have. Is it not frightful? They both agreed it was frightful, then made several bizarre remarks. Make rain and fine weather. One man, the council, by the nose, bits of absurd sentences that got the better of my drowsiness, so that I had pretty near the whole bit of my, my wits about me when the uncle said, the climate may do away with this difficulty for you. Is he alone there? Yes, answered the manager. He sent his assistant down the river with a note to me in these terms. Clear this poor devil out of the country and don't bother sending more of that sort. I had rather be alone than have the kind of man you can dispose of with me. It was more than a year ago. Who sent this note to him? Kurtz. I don't want any more of these guys. Kurtz is in charge here in the Congo. It's not the manager, it's Kurtz. Kurtz is dictating the terms. He says, I don't want you to send any more people down here to me. Can you imagine such impudence? Anything since then, said the other hoarsely. Ivory, jerked the nephew, lots of it. Prime sort, lots, most annoying from him. And with that, questioned the heavy rumble. Invoice was the reply fired out, so to speak, then silence. They had been talking about Kurtz. 
Now, he's already said that he admires Kurtz, does Marlowe. And why does he admire him? He is efficient. He gets the job done. He's the, an ubermensch. That's what he admires about him. He is clearly superior because he's better at getting ivory than anyone else. He doesn't admire him because he's morally superior. He doesn't admire him because he's morally inferior. He, de he admires him because he demonstrates the greatest efficiency and therefore he is at the top of the, he's an apex predator, if you will. That's what he admires about him. This Kurtz, that Kurtz had apparently intended to return himself, the station being by that time bare of goods and stores, but after coming 300 miles, had suddenly decided to go back, which he started to do alone in a small dugout with four paddlers, leaving the half cast to continue down the river with the ivory. The two fellows there seemed astounded at anybody attempting such a thing. They were at a loss for an adequate motive because he wants to go to Kurtz and nobody else will dare. What sort of man is he? And so they're in awe of Marlowe. Everyone else is terrified of Kurtz. Overawed by him, who will dare to go in the presence of Kurtz? I did not know the motive. Perhaps he was just simply a fine fellow who stuck to his work for his own sake. His name, you understand, had not been pronounced once. He was that man. The half-cased, who as far as I could see, had conducted a difficult trip with great prudence and pluck, was invariably alluded to as that scoundrel. The, sc the scoundrel had reported that the man had been very ill, had recovered imperfectly, and so forth. So Kurtz is ill downstream, but they're still terrified of him. Everyone lives in mortal terror of Kurtz, everyone around him. And that includes the natives and also the members of the company. They are terrified at him. The natives are terrified because they think he's a supreme being. The members of the company are terrified because here's a man who's beyond all good and evil. In other words, he will do anything to anyone who gets in his way. They're just terrified of a man with no moral constraint on him at all. How evil is he? There's nothing that he won't do. And Marlowe admires him. But it's interesting to hear the different voices and the different perspectives. They're not judging him for his immorality. It's not, it's not a moral judgment. It's, it's awe, it's reverence, it's fear, it's terror. So down they go. And they swore out loud, they swore aloud together out of sheer fright, I believe, and pretending not to know anything of my existence when he wakes up, pops up, turned back to the station. The sun was low, leaning forward side by side. They seemed to be tugging painfully uphill. There are two ridiculous shadows of unequal length that trailed behind them slowly over the tall grass without bending a single blade. And on they go towards Kurtz's station. And on and on and on. Try to be civil, Marlowe growled a voice, and I knew there was at least one listener awake besides myself. I beg your pardon. I forgot the heartache which makes up the rest of the price. And indeed, what does the price matter if the trick be well done? You do your tricks very well. And I didn't do badly either since I managed not to sink that steamboat on my first trip. It's a wonder to me yet. Imagine a blindfolded man set to drive a van over a bad road. That's what it was like being a captain on the Congo River. And that's what I did, and now this is what you're doing. The, the thing will break down eventually, and to make a long story short, or long chapter short, let me come down to the river, towards Kurtz's station, and as he gets there, note how the narrative just drags on. Note that there's no paragraphs either. There are paragraphs, but they're extremely long. It makes it very difficult to read. There's no ordering. Paragraphs give a sense of order, uh, of coherence, a, a thought per expressed in a paragraph, and then a new train of thought connected through some sort of uh, idea. Here, the paragraphs are just descriptive, and they seem to go on forever, and they're mixing in uh, persons' uh, speeches with 
descriptive landscape stuff and so forth. All of, again, very difficult for the reader. Two pilgrims were quarreling in hurried whispers to which, as to which bank. Left? No, 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 no. How can you? Right, right, of course. It is very serious of the manager's voice behind me. I would be desolated if anything should happen to Mr. Kurtz before we came up. Because Kurtz is sick and they want to get there before he dies. And they are called, they're called pilgrims because he is the shrine now. They're, he's a deity in the, in the jungle, more or less. But he gets there, and no sooner does he get there than the natives start firing arrows at him. Why? Because they think he's going to take Kurtz away. And they don't want that to happen. They think that there's some sort of magic or excellence about Kurtz's very presence, but they're attacked by the natives for, for the very attempt to come to Kurtz as they get forward. Do, 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 do. Kurtz may well be dead. Da, 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 da. And then there's a girl, a native girl, Mr. Kurtz's favorite. I'll skip over all that. Gosh, it's so long. It's such a hard book to uh, talk about in a brief lecture. Is he already dead? I don't think it is. But they've acted as if he is dead because they haven't seen him. And they're still ha progressing towards the station. That's what I thought as well. Is it in book three? Chapter three? I think it is. Where's the Mr. Kurtz is dead? I, d I want to at least get to this. The famous phrase. Not, I don't want this. I don't want T.S. Eliot's The Hollow Man. Ah. Sorry? <laughs> Chat GBT, yeah. Um, don't get me going. He must... Is it in two or three? It is in three. Red Towson's book. Oh, I'm in three there. Okay. It is. And there's the Russian. Okay, now we're getting close. And there he hears Kurtz's voice, finally. At this moment, I heard Kurtz's deep voice behind the curtain, save me. Save the ivory, you mean? Don't tell me, save me. Why, I've had to save, I've had to save you. You are interrupting my plans now. Sick, sick. Marlowe goes there to get the ivory. Kurtz is the means of doing it. He doesn't come to save Kurtz. He doesn't care about Kurtz. He cares about the ivory. It's a it's a matter of efficiency. He's come to get the ivory. Kurtz hasn't delivered. He doesn't give a rip about Kurtz, actually, although he loved, he admired Kurtz when he could get the ivory. Now that he can, he doesn't care if he lives or dies. Six, 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 not as six as you believe. Never mind, I'll carry my ideas. Yeah, I will return. I'll show you what can be done. You with your little peddling motions, you are interfering with me. I will return. I, the manager came out. He did me honor to take me under the arm and lead me inside. He's very low, very low, he said. He considered it necessary to sigh, but neglected to be consistently sorrowful. He's acting, because he doesn't care about Kurtz either. But on he goes in there, and he says, we must be cautious yet. The district is closed to us for a time. Deplorable. Upon the whole, the trade will suffer. I don't deny there is an un a remarkable quantity of ivory, mostly fossil. We must save it at all events. But look how precarious the position is, and why? Because the method is unsound. That's the object. The method's unsound. It's not efficient. 
Do you, I said, looking at the shore, call it unsound method? Without doubt, he exclaimed hotly. Don't you? No method at all, I murmured after a while. Exactly, he exulted. I anticipated this. Shows a complete want of judgment. It's my duty to point out it in the proper quarter. Oh, I said, I, that fellow, what's, what's his name? The brickmaker. We'll make a readable report for you. He appeared confounded for a moment. It seemed to me I'd never breathed an atmosphere so vile, and I mentally turned to Kurtz for relief, positively for relief. Not, nevertheless, I think Mr. Kurtz is a remarkable man, I said with an emphasis. He started, dropped on me a heavy glance, and said very quietly, he was, and turned his back on me. My hour of favor was over. He will then go in the presence of Kurtz, and it was Kurtz that ordered the attack on the steamer. And Kurtz that has led the whole retinue to receive him as they have. Gosh, it goes on and on and on. And now it's Kurtz. I had immense plans, he muttered irresolutely. Yes, said I, but if you try to shout, I'll smash your head with. There's not a stick or a stone near. I will throttle you for good, I corrected myself. I was on the threshold of great things, he pleaded in a voice of longing, with a wistfulness of tone that made my blood run cold. And now for this stupid scoundrel, your success in Europe is assured in any case, I affirmed steadily. I did not want to have the throttling of him, you understand. And indeed, it would have been very little use for any practical purpose. I tried to break the spell, the heavy mute spell of the wild wilderness. So note that Marlowe would be just as happy to throttle him, he doesn't actually care. He admires the man, but why does he admire the man? Not because of the man, because of what the man represents. And again, if he's weak and so forth, well then we, we can dispense with the man. But he says that he's, he, he has a man here who had kicked himself loose of the earth, like the Ubermensch. He's no longer a man. He's raised himself of this. Confound the man, he kicked the very earth to pieces. He was alone, and I before him did not know whether I was. I stood on the ground or floated in the air. I've been telling you what we said, repeating the phrases we pronounced, but what's the good? They were common everyday words, the familiar vague sounds exchanged on every waking day of life. But what of that? They had behind them, to my mind, the terrific suggestiveness of suggestiveness suggestiveness of words heard in dreams of phrases spoken in nightmares soul if anybody ever struggled with the soul i am the man and i wasn't arguing with a lunatic either believe me or not his intelligence was perfectly clear concentrated is true upon himself with horrible intensity yet clear and therein was my only chance barring of course the killing him there and then which wasn't so good on account of unavoidable noise that's the only reason he won't just kill him is because it would make noise. And if he made noise, maybe people, people would come in and kill him. That's his only objection. But his soul was mad. Why is his soul mad? Because he is overcome by death. And when he's about to dire, to die, dire, to die, a voice it rang to the very last. It survived his strength to hide in the magnificent folds of eloquence, the barren darkness of his heart. Oh, the struggle. He struggled the waste of his weary brain. And at the end of it, he speaks out. His was an impenetrable darkness. I looked at him as if you peer down at a man who's lying at the bottom of a precipice where the sun never shines. Here's a man whose soul has, has so lost its compass that he's a black man morally black his soul's totally black he looks down upon him and he looks upon himself in that way but look at this fr this phrase and all the references to darkness in relation to kurtz but as he dies he cries out mr kurtz the horror the horror in a whisper and marlowe in response i blew the candle out and left the cabin <sighs> out reference to macbeth out out brief candle allusion to that signifies nothing the man's dead the manager's boy put his insolent black head in the doorway and said in a tone of scathing contempt mr kurtz he dead as i say t.s Eliot makes it for uh, his poem but the contempt why the contempt it's just a man 
He thought that he was a god. Same perspective. It's all about power. It's all about being at the top of the evolutionary ladder. Everyone is, is acting in accordance with power and without moral consideration. The heart of darkness is about a society that is pantheist from its top to the bottom, its roots and so forth. It's not about colonialism per se. It's about a particular type of colonialism that's motivated by Darwinist survival motivations. And that's the real problem that is at the end of the 19th century going into the 20th century, it will also characterize the 20th century. Loss of moral compass, lack of belief, growing nihilism, despair, growing government control over all of life for the sake of promoting life without any particular definition of life, let alone, let alone a moral one, let alone a personal one. Um, anyway, that's where we're at. I know it's a bleak story, but it's now done, so it has that virtue. <laughs>